Let us go to the word now. John 14, verse 6, and James 1, 12 to 18. Our God is the true Father. 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 He is uh, the true Father because he gives birth to children through the word of truth, as we just read. He gives birth to his children through the word of truth, and he also nurtures them then uh, with the word of truth. So the way he gives birth is through the word of truth, and the children to whom he gives birth, uh, he does not abandon them as orphans, but he nurtures them. Uh, and that is also with the word of truth. So if we have faith in God, if we believe God to be the true father, it is to grasp uh, the truth that he is. Grasp, grasp the way, his way. So grasping is understanding, but it's a little more than understanding because I think the word understanding is like, Perhaps it's like a continuous thing, you know, the continuous process that's implied. But it also means the moment of understanding. Like there's that moment of what you call epiphany. Like you, you got it. The light bulb goes off, right? So grasping, or, or a religi in religious context, they call it enlightenment. Like that moment of being enlightened, the switch going on or off, or whatever, however you call it, it's that moment of spark. So it's to grasp, finally grasp, like you're taking a hold of something, grasping none other than his way, the truth, the true way. And therefore, living this life according to that faith, that confession, which is not to be deceived, as the passage that we just read warns us, to not be deceived, not be deceived, and not deceive ourselves. Because we have to keep in mind, deception does not come just from others, but from ourselves, as we just read. You are enticed by your own evil desires. So it's not to be deceived. Rather, doing and living the true way that the Father has shown us. That's what faith life, the Christian life, is about. Amen? Amen. I talked about the way, the only way, some weeks back, and that was certainly not an easy message, but um, maybe some, some of you can sort of surmise or anticipate something similar. But, you know, it is from the same word, and it is the word of God, the word of Jesus, that we are sharing the word today. And it is the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me, Jesus said. So... He, uh, he said that he's the way, the truth. Um, so it was kind of tricky for me to come up with the more, you know, the, the, the best uh, fitting title because the true way seems redundant because the way already shows the truth. But because there are so many uh, ways that people talk about, especially in the religious and philosophical context or even in societal context, many people talk about different ways, right? All roads lead to Rome, for example. Many ways to the truth, many paths to life, and so on. Um, I want us to look to the Bible, look to the Word of God, and find the way that is defined and shown as the true way. Um, so the, the truth then, or a truth, um, which is discussed and uh, studied by uh, the world as well, uh, is something that doesn't change. And again, just as what we read, James 1.17, it's, it's, um, truth is something that does not shift, like a, sh a shifting shadow. Um, it's not something that's there in the morning and gone uh, in the afternoon, or something that changes um, its form or whatever. So truth is uh, something that has no change and no deceit. Um, and when something is defined to be truth uh, or true, uh, it's a principle um, that is and should be very simple. Um, and that's uh, what we learn in, you know, school, like logic, um, like math, like math and science. You learn about many, many uh, principles, uh, 
called, what, what is it, theorems or something in geometry. So you try to prove something. You start with hypothesis and you go through all these things called evidence and then therefore it's true or not or accept or reject or something like that. So um, it is based on a very simple uh, principle and shouldn't therefore require any uh, analysis, you know, deep thinking and deep, um, you know, searching. It should be very simple. However, thanks to the philosophers and the religious, uh, truth seems to be very distant from us. So even though we use the words like, I want to know the truth, tell me the truth, you know, what is the truth? Uh, but really when you talk about truth, you know, or the truth, it is something that's um, not an everyday concept. It's, you know, it's something that uh, these people who have a lot of time to waste, I guess, or, in, uh, you know, enjoy, like, reading lots of books and thinking a lot and, you know, going to the mountains or sitting under a tree and with a lot of messy hair and a lot of dirt on them and <laughs> really being in another world, right, thinking and trying to figure out what the truth is. Uh, they have really made it um, complicated for the general population. Um, one of the good examples of philosophy, now that we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, folks who come from uh, China or Chinese background, and I think I've mentioned this before, is Taoism, uh, anglicized as Taoism. So Tao uh, is um, defined as the way, okay? So, uh, or the path or principle, um, and it is defined as the natural way of the universe. So um, Taoism uh, is, this school, is this thought, and it's connected to the philosophy Taoism as well as religion Taoism. So there is a, a religion that is based on this thinking and this whole idea of yin yang, right? So the opposites sort of work together to harmonize the universe. So um, the way is what uh, be began, how the world began and how the world is maintained. The world meaning the universe. So uh, this is pretty impressive in the sense that Thousands of years ago, people actually thought about this, you know. So it's, it's an ancient thought uh, in the Chinese culture. And it's really deeply rooted in the China, even to this day, the, the modern China or the Chinese people thinking is based on this. So there is this sort of general idea of the way or, or way or path that, um, that dictates or that di uh, governs uh, the universe and therefore our lives. And it, it's all about harmony, right? So uh, it could be very generic, but then it can also have very specific uh, implications like when it is in a uh, religious um, you know, form. So Taoism it, uh, says, you know, it's, there is no one person who can say the way, but it is sort of the way, the natural way of things you know, working and how they will work out. So that's one example, and that's how religions are and philosophies are in general. They talk about ways and, and, and paths and roads, but no one can specifically say they are the way, the true way. Um, it is sort of up to us to figure that out and to get there. Um, but certainly there is that um, one truth that no one can deny, that no one can change, and everyone therefore has to accept, and that is life and death. No ifs or buts about that. Anything that lives ends in death. And that's the principle, that one governing principle that was placed in, in the beginning of the uh, universe until its end. No one can change that. Even if the modern science, technology, or whatever can try to extend the life uh, by providing quality of life, uh, improving the quality of life, whether in the form of health or society, policies, or whatever it is, um, there's no way to escape this principle that was laid in the beginning, and that is that anything that breeds today, anything that comes to life, must die, will die in the end. And that is the, sh the principle that God laid in the beginning. So when you look at the book of the Bible, when you, it starts with Genesis chapter 1, uh, where it says, in the beginning, God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. Yes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That beginning in the Bible highlights the beginning of life called the universe. So the physical world that we live in, even though we don't get to see the, its entirety, 
uh, it has a beginning. And yes, scientists agree that it began with something called the Big Bang. So at that moment, uh, life began. Um, what, you know, whether it was right away or thousands of years or millions of years later, but something, you know, and the science says, you know, well, something like amoeba, um, then uh, well, there's water, moisture, and amoeba, and evolved into different species, and here we are today. So based on this sort of theory uh, of uh, something called the Big Bang and evolution, that all life came to be today. This is what scientists uh, believe is uh, a truth, but they, most of the world has accepted as the truth um, today. However, the irony is no matter how much they know today, uh, no one was there to see it for themselves to say, I'm a witness of that life, the beginning of life, and I can testify to that. It's just to guess scientifically, right? Uh, but what the Bible says is that God created the heavens and the earth, and it was by his word he began all things. And he said, what was his first cre creation? The light. And he said, let there be light. And the light came the light came so the light came from darkness so there was darkness there was no light before but when god commanded light light came to be so out of darkness came uh, light and from that moment life began as we know it um but with that principle, so many multiple countless principles have been laid in the entire universe uh, and scientists have done a good job and are still doing a good job to this day, discovering, you know, unveiling uh, these many principles. You know, I don't know how many of you remember but when you were young, you would do like a color, you would color a picture and then you would uh, paint over or color a black crayon over that. And you take a coin and you scratch and you make outlines and the outlines will reveal the colors underneath, right? So, so there is a picture that's underneath that you don't see because you have painted over or color over with this uh, dark color. But then as you scratch the corners or wherever on the paper, then it starts to re uh, reveal. Or maybe I should use the example of playing the lotto. Yeah, then you scratch with the coin. Then, <laughs> then now I have you, if you're like, what, the color? But lotto, you got me. Okay, so you understand. So you scratch it and then you get the, the, the number. Uh, and that will reveal whether you are the winner or the rest of the world losers, right? So, um, so it reveals what's hidden. So that's the uh, the work of the Creator um, uh, that He put, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, as sort of mystery hidden uh, throughout the universe. And the effort of man uh, has been to unra unravel, unveil, and discover. So, you know, something as widely accepted as truth, like the law of gravity. Like someone had to think about that, sitting under an apple tree, right? So it's like, oh, how did that fall, right? So, you know, how do these things, why are these things hitting and falling and hitting my head, you know? And then you think about gravity. So then uh, that is tested and experimented over and over again, and then it's sort of proven and accepted as uh, truth. That's just one of them, however. There are multiple, multiple, and again, countless principles that scientists to this day are struggling and putting effort to discover and apply that to our human life, to improve it. Right? So that is what the Creator laid uh, and put into place, into motion, as the song we, uh, says, as we just sang, you put into motion right, uh, in the created world. So with that, uh, not only the light come or gravity start to work, but again, this whole notion of life beginning and ending, the sun rising and setting. So it's like the pendulum of, uh, of a clock, of a grandfather clock, tick-tock. So it, it is swinging and it is moving. It is here, but gone tomorrow. So following this pattern of life, the world continued to this day and has not changed. Has not changed. Even if the law of gravity was challenged when... Uh, the astronauts went outside the atmosphere and landed on the moon, right? And then realized that doesn't work. The, gravity does not, uh, the law of gravity does not apply here. Um, this principle of living and dying, no one can uh, fight that. No one uh, can challenge that. So we see that continuing to this day. And therefore, God did not have plan to reveal himself temporarily as the life that is here today or gone tomorrow in this world. But beyond that, 
he wanted to uh, have relationship uh, with men and give the life that is beyond that for uh, the men uh, that he made. And the, the way he made man, therefore, was not from just from the dust of the ground uh, that we understand. This flesh is what makes us live now and die uh, another uh, at the end of this life. But God breathed into a man that's made of, uh, of this dust of the uh, ground the breath of life and made him a living being. Altogether, a living being. So Genesis 2, 7 says, man was made a living being when God breathed into him the breath of life. And because God is spirit, man became spirit. And spirit means what? Does spirit have an end like the flesh? Not like the flesh. It is not like the flesh. The flesh lives a finite time on earth. It spoils then, after it dies, it's, it's spoiled, it perishes and fades away. But the spirit lives an infinite uh, infinitely, I want to say infinitely. Um, it does have a beginning, however, because it began with God. So it came from God. And then after the flesh, uh, after it leaves the flesh, while the flesh perishes, the spirit continues to exist. Now for the spirit to live in the life of God, like God, um, God gave the word uh, as way to receive that life. And it, the word came in the form of command for this living being that we call our ancestor named Adam. So in Genesis 2.17, God said to the man, you shall not eat from this tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you eat of it, you will surely die. You will certainly die. And he was speaking to the spirit that the man had now become. And the man had to eat that word, obey that word, follow that word for the spirit to stay alive, to live, not to be cut away, cut off from uh, the life of God. But he was deceived through the woman uh, by the serpent that was in the garden, Genesis 3, who said, you will not surely die even if you eat it. Instead, you will be like God. You will know many things like God. You will live beyond this life because you will be like God. So he was deceived by those words, and he ate the forbidden fruit. So he was deceived. Um, the woman was deceived first, and then she communicate the same words to the man, and the man was deceived. So who was this serpent? The serpent who showed up from nowhere. There are many, certainly, creatures in the garden at the time. The serpent, the snake, was not the only creature. There were many. But the serpent showed up to deceive the man. And because this serpent was not really a serpent, he was actually a fallen angel. Let's go to Isaiah 14 to see where he came from. 14, 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. So here, the one who is talking in that quotation, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on throne in, in the mount of assembly at the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I was. So this is a creature saying, I will be like the most high. Who is the most high? The most high is God who created all things, including this creature that is thinking this. So here's a creature thinking, I will be like the creator. Is that possible? No. But the creature deceived himself thinking. Because elsewhere in Ezekiel 28, describing the same creature, saying he was perfect and a model, uh, model of perfection, it was, was given beauty and talent. So this was a creature called an angel. In fact, an archangel, a leader of different angels, to, um, to serve God, but with his talent and beauty to worship him and to glorify uh, God. And this was in the spiritual heaven. So in the spiritual heaven, the angels were made and placed to magnify his glory uh, and to worship him there. And to do that well, this particular angel was given beauty and um, talent. But because of that, the angel said to himself, man, I'm beautiful and I'm perfect. I'm good. Look at all these people telling me I'm so good and I'm so talented. What happens when people compliment you over and over again? You become big-headed. Can't get through the door. So it's big-headed and pride 
and got the best of him. So then he said to himself, hey, why not? I will be like God. So he deceived himself. So we see that the origin of sin is in this creature called Lucifer, and he's later on known to be Satan. Satan means the rebel of God, the one who rebels against God, against the Most High. So he, this is the Satan, and also known as the devil. Same person, same uh, being. He challenged God, even though he's creature, to be bound in, and, and to live uh, governed by the creator. He forgot. He fooled himself thinking he could be like the creator. And no wonder he showed up in the garden because now he was contained in the universe. That's what it says. I threw you out. I heard you down to the earth, um, uh, elsewhere it says. And that was indicating that he was thrown out of the spiritual heaven where he sinned and contained in the universe where he's locked until the day of judgment. And there man was made, this living being Adam. So he showed up deceiving the same way. You will be like God. Right? So he deceived himself in the spiritual heaven. Same lies. With the same lies, he is. Uh, he deceived uh, the man, and the man ate. Therefore, right away, Adam and Eve, the man and the woman, were cast out from the, the garden, and God put a flaming sword around the garden so that they would not return to the Garden of Eden. The sword, the shield that, uh, that um, covered, uh, un uh, made the garden hidden. So the Garden of Eden sounds like the modern-day Iraq because that's where the four uh, river heads come out, and this is sort of the, uh, the, the epicenter of the uh, ancient civilization, human civilization of Mesopotamia. So the, geographically, we can locate where this uh, Garden of Eden might have been, but there is no such place today. Physically and symbolically, there's no place like that. It's because it became hidden. And what that symbolizes is that the truth that all men yearn for, the truth that can go beyond the life and the death of this world, became hidden, veiled because of sin. However, God had the plan to reveal himself as the true father who leads to the truth because he is the truth, because he's the true father. He began, by his wor he began his work by calling on a people because two little children, you can't teach them geometry, right? They don't know anything. So you have to start with, you know, that's a dot, that's a line, that's blue and black, and that's yellow. We have to teach them very basics, like a tutor leading little children, young children. That's why God began with the people in the Old Testament by stages, revealing himself. And that was call, by calling the people of Israel. So he called them out of their slavery in Egypt, and he led them out of uh, their slavery and brought them into the desert where uh, they travel and live for 40 years with the promise that he will bring them to the promised land, the land of Canaan. But during the time of their desert life, God gave them the law. The law of God, also known as the law of Moses. So the law of Moses, how many commandments were there? Or how many points? Most people think the law of Moses was just te the Ten Commandments. Certainly he did bring down the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments written. But there were more than that. Because when you read through uh, the, the book, you know, of, um, the books like Exodus, Deuteronomy, you know, even Leviticus, all of them deal with the law and different parts of the law. And there's so many points to the law. Um, so the Ten Commandments are actually the representative, like the major uh, commandments, but behind them were these hundreds of points, and, and to be specific, 613 points to the law. So the law was given to the people of Israel, and this was for men to know about God, that God is the one who gave this com these commandments, and you are to accept them because they agreed. God said, you want to be my people? You have to agree on these terms, and the, on these terms. And the terms were the commandment, the law. And the people said what? Amen. amen. They, say, they say, amen, we will be your people. And sure, we will keep the commandment because we will be the first, the only people on earth who would have relationship with God. To no other people did God speak. To no other people did he reveal himself, but to the people of Israel. So they understood that it is the greatest privilege to be the people above all the peoples on earth. So that's why they said, yes, we will. So they shed blood of animals and they agreed and they signed the contract with the blood of animals saying, we will keep the commandments. So the commandments came. Now, the reason why the commandment came, however, was not to make them perfect goody-goody two-shoes righteous people. 
but it was for them to realize the reality of themselves. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So, uh, so let's pause there for a second. So until the law came, men didn't realize that they were in sin. When did sin come? When did it come? Where did it come from? So what was inside the spirit of all men? It's the sin that Adam committed, the original sin, right? The ancestor of men, because we all received um, the spirit of Adam, Romans 5.12 says that, and 1 Corinthians 15.22, that in Adam all men die. All men died. And that's referring to the sin that he committed by Dis being deceived, right? He was deceived by the serpent and he ate the fruit and that disobedience is called sin and that sin entered the spirit of Adam and as the lineage continued of, for all men, we inherited his spirit and with that spirit came sin and therefore the price of sin, that is, death. But because babies were being born, new lives were being formed, people didn't think about that, did not even know about it. Here is a live baby. You didn't give birth to a dead baby. These people are living, and babies are growing, and people are living and uh, maturing and so on. So they didn't think that they were dead. There was nothing wrong with them. But in reality, there was sin inside the spirit in all men. So without the law, no one would know that they were in sin, that they were sinners. And the price of sin was waiting for them. Without the law, no one could know that. No one can know this truth. That's why God sent the law to the people of Israel. So that men, as they try to keep the law, what do they find? Instead of keeping the law, they find themselves breaking. Okay, so the law said, um, so there are four commandments about you know, honoring God and, and worshiping God and uh, no, uh, no idolatry, no blasphemy against his name and not keeping Sabbath. So those are biggies, really biggies. So um, maybe this seems kind of distant, but even as close as things like honor your parents, right? Or um, do not covet your neighbor's things. So you are doing those things before, or you are uh, dishonoring your parents, or you're coveting your neighbor, or you're even lying, but you didn't feel guilty about it because there was no, no such thing as law saying, do not do it. If you do, then you are condemned as a sinner and you will pay the price of sin. Even if you're doing it, you, there was nothing telling you that it was wrong or that it was sin. But once the law came, the same behavior is now defined as sin. And it told, it told them, so as they tried to not lie, they tried to honor their parents and tried to not covet their neighbors like, <gasps> The neighbor got bigger car and bigger house and better wife, better husband than me. I have a stomach ache. So why is this happening? Because I am coveting my neighbor's things. The law says do not covet. Then now you realize, OMG, I have committed sin. Right? God calls this sin. So that's what this is saying, that I was, apart from the law, I was alive. I thought I was okay. I'm doing okay. But the law came, then it defined my Self as sinner. Therefore, I became dead. I died. That's what that means. Let's continue. T 12. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring, become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment sin might become utterly Sinful, because the law came to define sin, and therefore the price of sin, which is death, Matthew, uh, Romans chapter 6 says that the wage of sin is death. So because of the law coming, sin was defined, and therefore death was given as sentence, as punishment. So the law came to be known as the law of sin and death. Altogether, the law of sin and death. The law of condemnation. Because the law condemns sinners to death. So then you can't blame. It's the law that made me, that killed me, that put death to me. It's not the law. You're being deceived. Don't blame the law. 
What, what, what put you to death? It was sin. You didn't know it because you were deceived. Only when the law came, then you knew. So that's the function of the law. But the people didn't know that. But once the law came, however, in fear they honor the word of God that came in the form of the law, the commandment. And when God commanded the people of Israel to build the sanctuary, the first thing that they built was one item called the ark. And the ark of the testimony or the ark of covenant uh, held the stone tablets inside. So the stone tablets that Moses brought down as he heard the word of God and uh, God himself wrote it down and he put it into the two stone tablets and brought them down. They're written on the stones. First time he, Moses got angry at the people who, you know, blasphemy against God. So it was shat- they were shattered. But the second time around, stone tablets were moved into the, uh, the, the testimony. The stone tablets themselves tell you they're enduring. The commandments are enduring. Not only are they enduring by themselves, but they were placed inside the ark. And this was the ark of the law, the ark of the Lord. So you don't mess with that ark. So it's already very strong and sturdy. It will not move. But not only that, it was covered with the atonement cover. And the ark itself was overlaid with pure gold. So the law, the word of God. God himself became covered, covered, hidden, and the ark was not in a display in a museum, but it was inside where? The most holy place, which was the deeper room of the sanctuary behind the holy place. And this space called the sanctuary was covered. Um, if you were to from see from the floor point of view, it was there were these veils, the curtains that you had to go through. But from the aerial view, you, you would know that it was covered with fabrics, upholstery, heavy-duty fabrics to hide the word of God, hide uh, who God is. So that's what it symbolized, the flaming sword around the Garden of Eden and the sanctuary. And they understood that no one can mess with the word of God, that it is unchanging. He does not change. His word does not change. His coven- covenant, his commandment does not change. So they'd never thought of reforming the commandment. Right? You know how, like, in, in the Congress come up with, uh, comes up with, there's based on the U.S. Constitution, there are amendments and amendments, amendments, amendments just to add on, add on, you know, to revise, reinterpret. The law is constantly changing. But that's in the human society, not the Word of God, not the command of God. Right? They were never changed, never challenged, because the Word of God was to be received as is. So when the Son of God named Yeshua, Jesus, looked at the temple of God, which is the sanctuary later becoming uh, the permanent structure, which had these stone tablets inside the ark. What did he say that the Jews became angry and later put him to death? He said, destroy this temple. And that's written in John 2.19. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Looking at the temple of Jerusalem, which was built by Solomon, and had the same idea, the same um, uh, ark and same stone tablets that Moses made in the, uh, in the desert in the form of the tabernacle. And when he said that, the Jews heard it as destroying the law of God. On the one hand, they should have been like, yes, no more law. Right? What, what, shouldn't, they, shouldn't they have been happy about that? Maybe on the one hand, yes, but they knew better. They knew better that without the law of God, they will not be able to live. Right? They could not mess with God, the, mess with the word of God. So that's why on behalf of God, they became angry and later on conspired to put Jesus to death. But what Jesus was referring to, was the temple of his body. He was saying that you will put me to death. Already in John 2, 19, he's prophesying about his death. You will put me to death because I have come as the temple. My body is the temple. You will put me to death, but through my death, I will tear down this law of sin and death, this law of death, the law that puts you to death as a result of sin. I will put it to end through my death and But then through my resurrection, I will raise a new law, the law of, now we got rid of death. What do we have now? The law of life, the law of life. So Romans 1 to 2 talks about that. Therefore, there is no, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. So they understood that the price of sin is death because, you know, when someone was found to be breaking the law, what what happened to them? They were? killed instantly right away 
You know, you stole your neighbors, you either got your hand cut or your whatever, burn for burn, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You know, it was instant uh, retribution or life for life. So, and there were cases where they disobeyed God and it was uh, considered a sin against God and they were put to death right away. So they knew that the price of sin was death. But it was for them to know the truth that was veiled, and that is that they were dead in sin, in the spirit. And therefore, they were going to go and pay the price of their sin in the place of death for all souls, all, all spirit. And that is the fire hell, the lake of fire hell. So no one knew that, however, and that's why Jesus was saying that I have come to die, but not end up dead, but be risen to life, risen back to life. And through my death and my resurrection, I will tear down this law of death, but raise a new law, and that is the law of life. Hallelujah. But of course, people didn't understand because they were still deceived, deceived in sin and death, and they only thought it's the law that makes our lives miserable. It's the law that scares us, and we're afraid for our lives. They did not realize that they were in sin and death in their spirit. So that's why Jesus, every time he spoke, he said numerous times, truly, truly, I tell you, I tell you the truth. The, tr the words I speak are true because they are from my father. He said numerous times. Like it's almost like, okay, we heard that. Why are you repeating yourself, Jesus? It's because men did not know the truth. So let's go to John 8. eight forty three to 45. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Hold on a minute. My father, what are you talking about? My father lives in Queens. He lives in Queens Village in New York. That's where my father is. My father is no devil. Are you kidding me? Sometimes he does look like a devil, but he's not the devil. So people can be like, what, what was Jesus talking about? He was saying that because of the devil, you are doing things of the devil, things like the devil. So let's read on. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So father of lies, what is Jesus talking about? The murderer from the beginning? Who murdered in the beginning? Who's the first murderer? Cain. Cain killed his brother Abel in Genesis 4. But what the Bible says is that it was the devil who caused Cain to do that because the devil is the origin of sin. He's the deceiver who deceives man to sin. And he is the one who deceived Adam to challenge the word of God and take that fruit that was forbidden, to disobey the word of God. Therefore, the original sin occurred because he lied. He said, you won't die. Your spirit, nothing's going to happen to you, body or soul. You will be like God. Those were the sweet words to the ears of men, and that's why he was deceived. But here's Jesus saying, you're not listening to me. You don't believe a word I'm saying. What was Jesus saying? That he was saying that he was sent from God. By the Father, he came to the world to lead them to the truth. But nobody believed him. They thought he was crazy. That they, In the end, they thought he was a cult leader. He performed miracles, sure. He multiplied food and he healed the sick. He drove out demons even. But even that, they started accusing him. You must be possessed by the devil or demons to do that. Because they just could not accept his words. And that's what Jesus is saying. that You're not believing me because your father is a liar. He's the father of lies. So he's not saying that you're related to him physically. But because the devil is in the world and he's the deceiver, the tempter. All you have heard all your life in this world are lies. You think that is the truth, and once a man lives and, di and, and dies after this life, there's no way for him to come back from the dead, and that's the absolute truth. And I said that. I began 30 minutes ago talking to you about that principle that hasn't changed. But that's because man does not know the truth that Jesus would show through his resurrection because all men are hidden away, shielded from the truth, because of sin, because of the deceiver. And then here he says, finally, in 45, yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. 
So people who are exposed to lies all their lives, the boy who cried wolf, right? So you say, the wolf is coming. Wolf is, people first react, like, okay, the wolf is coming. But a couple of times later, it's like, he's just joking. So when finally the real thing shows up, nobody listens and they're all destroyed. So all men are used to the lies that the devil has shown, that there is no such thing as God. There is no such thing as heaven or hell. You can find the way to truth the way you want. Be a good man. And maybe God will remember that and take you to a good place. God doesn't kill. He's love. He doesn't punish. He saves all. Therefore, there's no hell. So these are all the things that the lies, the father of lies has produced over the history of mankind. And men have listened to this day. That's why Jesus repeated. And let's jump back up to 24 there. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe me that believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and I, what I have heard from him, I tell the world. Who sent Jesus to the world? Where does it say that? Go to John 1. Let's go to John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So who made the world? I had said, and in Genesis 1, 1, it says God made the world. But in John 1, 1, it's just more specific. It says, yes, God made the world, but it was the Word, who was with God, who was with God, who was in God, with God, made the world. It was the Word. And the Word is capitalized there. In Greek, it's whole logos. Because that Word is not sound, but it is a person that is distinguished from God, the Father. So the Word is a part of God who was met, planned to be manifested to the world, to men. The God who became hidden, the God that no man can approach on his own to know, was planned to be revealed in time. Not because men asked for it, not because men deserve it, but because it was God's plan to do so. It was his desire to do so. And he was called the Word. And this Word made the world. So this Word then, let's go to verse 14, became flesh. Meaning what? The Word became Man, the word came as man, and he made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from where? From the Father God, full of what? Grace and truth. And he is the Son of God. He is Jesus. He is Yeshua. Yeshua is his Aramaic name. That means he saves. So he is Yeshua who has come from the Father. Also in verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. The only one who has ever seen God is Yeshua, the Son of God, because he came from the Father. The only one who knows the Father, because he's with God, with the Father, is the Son, Yeshua. Do you understand? Amen? That's why he said, I have spoken to you the truth. Because the one who sent me is the truth. He is trustworthy. He is true. And his words are true. Therefore, the words I speak, which are his words, are true. Amen? Amen. But just like now, with people going, why is she getting all excited about this truth thing? I don't get what she's saying. All the more, all the worse for the people then. Because they were just refusing. They were refusing to accept Jesus as speaking the word of the Father God. They saw him just as a man. How can he be God? We know his mother and his father's brothers and sisters. We saw him from childhood. We saw him walking and talking. And now here he's saying, I come from the Father. I come from heaven. And I speak the truth. And you are the children of the devil. Could they have accepted him? No. Not only that, he was accusing them for being dead in sin. That's why they just couldn't accept Jesus. And a step further, Jesus said in, um, in, in John 8, 58, before Abraham was born, I am. I am he who is I am. I am that I am. Right, Exodus 3, 15 says, I am 14. So I am, meaning the sovereign, the uncreated, the creator God. 
And the people just couldn't accept it anymore. At that, they picked up stones to kill Jesus because this is what happens to people who challenge God, who want to be like God. They get stoned to death. But that was not the moment Jesus was going to die. That's why he avoided that. But he, numerous times, even though he is one with the Father, as he said in John 10, 30, he is God, as we just read. He is God in his essence and his nature. However, he called himself the Son of Man most of the times. What did he call himself? Even though he is what? God. Why did he do that? It's confusing. That's what we don't understand. That's why the truth is still veiled for many people. But if you are unveiled of who the, the truth and know that Jesus is the truth, then it won't be confusing. He is, the, he is God in his nature. But when he came as man, it was the moment he was objectified. It was the moment he objectified God as the father and he himself as the son. And the one who came as the son was going to die because he came in the flesh of man. So, he said again uh, in John 7, uh, 29, I know him because I am from him and he sent me. And he said in John 14, where we read earlier in verse 6, but before he, he said that, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in, you believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And then the, and then the uh, disciple said to him, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know how to get there? That's when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Where was he going? Where was he going when he said that? What was he talking about? Where was he going? Have I lost people already? Hello, everybody still here? Where was he going? He was going to the father's house. How was he going to get there? Was he going to take a cab? Call Uber? That's how he's going to get there? How was he going to get there? He had to die. Not my words. But the words of Jesus, not the word, not the teaching of COJ, Church of Jesus, the hardcore, these like strong people and ooh, strong message, but the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus. This is what Jesus said. And this is what Jesus showed. This is how he lived and died. And he said, I am going to the Father's house to do what? To prepare a place for you. Where's the Father's house? The Father's house is in heaven. The heavenly father. Who is our father? The true father who leads us to the truth. To the children, he gives birth in the word of truth. He leads them to the truth. In the word of truth, he nurtures them. But to make a way, the son of God came to the world to lay down his life, to die. And only then he would go to the father's house. He would become the way to the father. And show the way to the Father, the only true way, the only way. And that's why when it was time for him to die, he did not perform miracles. He did not save himself. But willingly he lay down and said, it is finished. The moment he died was the moment he laid down his life according to the Father's word. John 10, 17 to 18. Jesus, I have the authority to lay down my life and the authority to take it up again. I do it willingly, not because someone takes it away from me, but the Father commanded me, and because of his commandment, I willingly obey. I willingly lay down my life because I know that when I willingly lay down, that is the way to take it up again. That is the way to the Father's house. That is the way he's going to raise me to life. So according to the Father's word that is true, he obeyed. And in his obedience, in his act, one act of obedience, righteousness, he condemned the devil who is the father of lies, who lied to Adam and said, you will not surely die, and made Adam eat the fruit. Nothing was wrong with the fruit, but he dis disobeyed the word of God when he ate the fruit. Sin entered the spirit, and the spirit died cut off from the creator, cut off from God, and all men receive that consequence, which is death in the spirit. 
Only when the commandment came, we realize it was that we were sinners, dead in sin. But until this moment, the father of lies, the devil, was contained in the universe. But when Jesus died and showed that, yes, this is the way to live, this is the truth, laying down your life in obedience, full submission to the word of the father, the father of lies, the devil, was condemned once for all. Hallelujah. And by tearing his flesh like the veil in the temple when he died on the cross, Hebrews 10, 19 says, a new and living way was open for us through the curtain that is his flesh. So when Jesus died, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place, remember what was inside the most holy place? The ark. And inside the ark were the word of God, the stone tablets, revealing that the truth is hidden from men. You cannot know the truth. You cannot know God. You cannot come to God. You think that by becoming celibate and living in the mountains, becoming monks and nuns and praying and washing your bodies and not saying lies and not saying bad words and not looking at bad things that you're going to save yourself and become like God or be where God is and be enlightened to know the truth. No, absolutely not. You cannot make your way to heaven on your own. Because all men are dead in sin. All men inherited the spirit of Adam and therefore the original sin in their spirit. All doomed to follow the devil to the eternal fire, as Matthew 25, 41 says. So we are all to go pay the price of our sin in the, in the place of death, the second death. That became the destiny for all men. But by dying in place of men as a ransom for their sin, Matthew 20, 28, Jesus, I laid down my life as a ransom so that many would be forgiven, many would live. He tore his flesh and shed his precious blood to make a way for men. But before that, what he simultaneously accomplished was that he sprinkled his blood into the Father's house that he would enter. Now, in the Old Testament, the priests had to sprinkle blood inside. So they would have to dip brush into a bowl of blood, and they would just spray the place with blood. And this was according to the law of God. You have to do that because the sins of Israel defile the, the tabernacle. You commit a sin, and your sins made the holy place unclean. So the blood has to cleanse it. So to symbolize that, the priest would enter with the blood of animals, would take a brush and sprinkle this place where they serve God. Only then what they did inside was received by God. So here is Jesus now fulfilling the foreshadow of the Old Testament. As he died, he shed his blood, and he sprinkled in the heavenly tabernacle as Hebrews 9, 8, 9 also, they both talk about. Why did he have to do that? What's wrong with heaven? Why was heaven unclean? The Father's house being in heaven which is also called the heavenly tabernacle. Why did he have to do that? What was wrong with it? Let's go to Hebrews 9, 8 quickly. Hebrews 8. 8, 1 to 2. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. Are you with me? Now the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So here the contrast is being made between the true tabernacle set up by the Lord and then there is a tabernacle that's set up by men. So the latter tabernacle, which one is that? The tabernacle set up by men. Which one is the writer talking about? The tabernacle of the Old Testament that Moses made, the people of Israel made, according to God's instructions. So that's the earthly sanctuary, earthly tabernacle. But here is the true tabernacle, because what the Bible is saying, that was not the true tabernacle. The Jews said, no, this is the one that God told us to build, and this is where we serve God. This is where we heard from God. This is where we pray to God. This is where we come to God. But that's just a shadow, Hebrews 9 said, a shadow of copies of the true thing to come. And the true thing, the true tabernacle, would be set up by the Lord Jesus. And it would be through his precious blood that it would be cleansed and established. And that is referring to the heavenly tabernacle that he would enter after shedding his blood. After his resurrection, he will enter and make a way in there through his death, his shed blood. Do you understand? Amen? So here is Jesus, the incarnate word, 
The flesh of Jesus is the incarnate word, the word that became flesh, the spirit that became flesh, the spirit that became blood. When he shed that, when he sprinkled, he shed, he spilled his blood. What he spilled was the word of truth. Do you understand? Because this is, his flesh is what, once again? The word. It's the word. Whole logos. His, his blood is also the word. Are you with me so far? Yes? The flesh is what? The word. Whose flesh am I talking about? The flesh of Yeshua. And his blood is also what? The word. And the word is the truth. So where we began, we're coming in full circle in James 1. He gave birth to us through the word of truth. What does that mean? You know, many people think like, oh, it's just by saying, memorizing the word, and you say, you're my father, or a heavenly father, I'll memorize that he's my father. No. The word of truth is referring to the incarnate word, the, the flesh that became, the word that became flesh, the word that became blood, referring to the flesh of Jesus. Because it's that word that he spilled in the form of blood. He gave birth to not our flesh, but the souls of all men. Hallelujah. That's what it means when he shed his blood on the cross 2,000 years ago. It was the moment that he shed his life to give birth, as a mother does when she gives birth to babies. They shed a lot of blood. With that blood, a baby's born. New life is born. When Jesus died, he spilled his blood. Oh, poor Jesus. That's not what I mean. That blood he shed is the word, the word of truth. Because all men are dead in sin, deceived. To follow the deceiver, the deceiver, to hell. And the Bible does warn lies, liars as the deceivers. Those who are deceived, who are deceivers, liars will go to hell. The Bible treats lies so seriously. Why? Because that's the word of sin. Where do, where do sins begin? From lies. And the devil being the deceiver, the origin of sin, because of him, man sin, and because of him, to this day, they don't believe. They believe in his lies. Because of him, they don't listen. And even now, sitting here, maybe some of you are getting bored. And this is like, oh, my gosh, so hard to hear. But if I tell you, listen to me, I'll, you'll make a million bucks. All of you will be jumping out of your seats and taking notes. Because why? That's just full of lies. You like that. Follow me, and I'll make you rich. Follow me, I'll make you successful. Follow me, you'll have a happy life. You love it. There are many, many people filling up the churches today, so-called churches around the world, tens of thousands of people, and they don't have room for them. They say, please don't come anymore. We don't have seats for you. We don't have parking lot for you. Well, what are they preaching? Believe Jesus, and you and your family will be rich and happy and successful. You will live the best life, best, best, best life. Every day will be best life for, for yourselves. People love that. You don't need to evangelize for those people. They just show up. They buy their books. They buy their videos. They pour their money because they love that. But are those words the words of truth? They have nothing to do with what Jesus said. But they love that. They eat them up. Why? Because they're children of the father of lies. For that, Jesus shed his blood and he gave birth so that we can finally know the truth, finally come to him, finally have a way to go to the Father's house in heaven. Hallelujah. And he died. He did die. But in three days, the Father raised him back to life. And Jesus resurrected. Do you believe Jesus resurrected from the grave? That he rose from the grave? Do you believe? His resurrection revealed that not only is he truth, the truth, not only are his words true, but also revealed the true way of dying to live. His resurrection not only revealed that he is the truth, that his words are the truth, but revealed the way to live. The true way to live, and that is to die. Yes, it's to die. One has to die to live, and that's the principle that Jesus laid through his life and death and finally resurrection. Do you want to go to the Father's house? I'm going to make a... I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to him except through me. 
So we understand, those of you who have been in the church long enough and you've been hearing, yes, Jesus is the only way, one way, one way, Jesus is the way. We know that, and by believing and confessing Jesus is the Lord and no one else, the salvation is given to no other name but through the name Jesus, Yeshua. We know that we confess to say it, sing it, and we believe that, accept that. But then somehow there's detach how to live and what those words mean. Jesus showed through his body the way to live, and that's to die. For us to know that, the ones who have been given birth by the word of truth, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Yeshua, the Holy Spirit came in the same name. The Holy Spirit came from that true tabernacle where Yeshua sat down on the throne as the risen Lord, the King of Kings. From there, the Holy Spirit, the counselor, was sent not to the general world, not to unbelievers, but to those believe, who believe, who have received the name Yeshua as the name of their King, of their Savior, who have confessed that he is without sin, but he died in their place to redeem their, of their sins so that they can live, that he is their father, the father of their souls. Say amen if you believe that you have father in heaven. Amen. Are you sure? Yes. Who is he? Some people say, well, Jesus, he's only 33 years old, but you are 50 years old. How can that be? It has to be the older guy with the gray hair and gray beard who's been around since the beginning. Very old God. Who says God is old anyway? Does God age? He is spirit. He's not like God. So we have to throw that imagination away out the window. Forget about that. That's not who God is. God has no body. He's spirit. He's too gray. No one will ever see him. No one can ever hear from him. No one can even touch him, have a relationship with him without him revealing himself to us. And the way he did was through the word that became flesh to give us birth as his children through his word of truth, the precious blood of God, the blood of Christ, the blood of Yeshua. Hallelujah. So if you receive the blood of Yeshua, then you are a child of Yeshua. Amen. The Holy Spirit who comes as the spirit of truth, as Hebrews 8 and 2 says, the spirit of truth has come in the children of God. As John 1, 12 says, those who believe in the name, receive his name, the name Yeshua, will receive the right to become his children. In such souls, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, lets them know that the only way to the Father's house in heaven is Yeshua. The truth, the way, the true way. What's the big deal about going to the Father's house? That's eternal life. Eternal life is not living long living a comfortable life by improving my lifestyle, making enough money and having happy family and good career, good family, good, good plans and good package deals and re retirement plans and all that. That's not what etern eternal life is. Eternal life is not to be had in this world because this world will end like everything in this world. This world itself will end. Not, it doesn't mean it will disappear, but it was made to contain these fallen angels finally to be turned into the lake of fire, hell, Hades, hell, this is it. So where we need to go for our spirit is to be saved out of this burning place and enter the Father's house where eternal life is waiting for us, amen? Eternal life is to live with God, like God, forever, happily, joyfully, gloriously in his environment, hallelujah. But for us to get there, called the Father's house, we have to go through this thing called resurrection, death, and resurrection, life, it, it, we live this life, but we are going to die. But death has to come first before resurrection. But resurrection is the reward, the resurrection to life anyway. All men will rise. John 5, 29 says, all will rise. But there will be those who will, who will, be, who will rise to be condemned, while there will be those who will rise to live. So for us to rise to live when Jesus comes back, we have to know, not just with our heads and with our lip service, that Jesus is the only way, the true way. But it's to live the same life as his disciples who followed him. So he said in, Matthew, in Luke, Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, 
Jesus said to them all who were there. So when Jesus spoke in Luke 9 there, there were crowds of people, crowds of people. There were lots of people, hundreds, even thousands of people. And he spoke to them, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple, you don't have to look, listen, Whoever wants to be my disciple, my disciple. So we tend to think like disciple, discipleship. It's like, okay, he's the master, and he will tell me, and I will learn. Like I volunteered to become his disciple, so I'm going to learn some kind of skill from him and some special teaching from him. On the one hand, disciple has that meaning, but disciple simply means a follower. So why do we need to follow Jesus? What, what does he have to offer? What does he have to offer? Eternal life. That's why he said, no one can come to the Father except through me. No one can come to eternal life except through me. So say amen if you want eternal life. Because pretty much if the other option is eternal damnation in hell. Yes. So eternal life is not because we don't want hell, but we want that. But otherwise, there is the place of fire, eternal fire, real place. For eternal suffering in the resurrected body that's waiting for the rest. So if we want eternal life, then we have to follow him and become his disciple. So here's what Jesus said. If you want to be my disciple, whoever wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He was speaking to crowds of people. And he said, I will go to heaven, prepare a place for you. Don't you think he wants us to all come there? Isn't he love? Certainly he is love. Yes, he wants us to come and live with him and live like him forever. But here's condition. You cannot surpass this principle. Just like you cannot surpass the principle of life and death within the universe. You want to get out of this universe and enter the Father's house where eternal life is to be had? You must follow this principle. And that is, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. So whoever wants to save his life must lose his life first. Not my words, folks. These are words of Jesus. And there are many new people here today. And yes, my heart is heavy because it's hard for you to keep up with the teaching. And some of you are going like, Pastor, why are you preaching about that when I brought a newcomer? I've been working on this guy for weeks and weeks, and now you're going to drive him away. Not only do I have to live according to the truth myself, I have... My weight, the weight of my cross is to lead all to the truth by speaking and teaching, counseling, suggesting, advising to live the way of the truth. And that is death. The true way that Jesus entered the Father's house was through the cross. The cross that he died on was the ultimate form of self-denial, the height of his shame, suffering, sorrow, pain. And here is Jesus himself saying, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, we read books like James or Hebrews. It's hard to take. Those of us who read those books are very difficult. You know, it's like the four gospel books, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Sounds good. The good, good news, the gospel. But when you read books like Hebrews and James, it's very scary because it's sort of like warning against the Christians. Don't do this if you lie. And if you don't have any fruit, you're going to be falling away. You're going to be thrown into the fire. You lie and you're proud and you gossip. You're going to burn in hell. <gasps> oh, my God. So scary. You know who spoke the scariest message, in fact, was... Jesus himself. He never sugarcoated his message. He is the one who said it like it is because he is the truth. He spoke the truth. 
He spoke the true words and showed the true way. And the way that you cannot surpass is to, to die first. You want to live, you have to die. You want to gain, you have to lose. You can't surpass that. And you can't have it all. There's a Korean saying, you save a man from drowning. And the first thing he says, where's my bag? Can you get my bag too? So many people who call themselves Christians, born-again Christians, who say what a wretch I was, and he say, me, I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. Then my life has improved now. I don't want to talk about the past. No good for nothing, loser, thief, and drug addict, dealer, whatever I was, prostitute. We move on. My life has to look better. It has to improve. So where's my bag? And then they get upset and they pray, what's wrong with you? Pastor asks, oh, he's not answering my prayer. I thought God was going to give me this dream job and this career, this family. And I thought it was all supposed to get better and better and improve, right? Is that right? Perhaps you started on the wrong truth. Perhaps it wasn't the truth that you thought was. You see, for us to gain eternal life, we have to lose willingly. There has to be cost. We are in the season of dedication where we think about that. You know, we try to pull people for time and say, okay, you have to modify your schedule for the next month and these two weeks. It's crunch time, crunch time. You got to be here every other day besides your Wednesday meeting or Friday meeting. We're going to meet every day. It's like, oh, God, okay, I'm here. So could you just hurry up and then... Just sitting there counting and watching their clock. It's like putting me to pressure. It's like, oh, my God, this guy is in a rush. His life is so important. I got to hurry and make this schedule work for him and her. You know what? I don't even care about myself. It's about Jesus. Do you try to put Jesus, try to make Jesus fit into your schedule? I want you to think about that. Am I trying to fit Jesus into my busy life? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In a month of September, October, I force Jesus to work with my schedule. And then rest of the year, I have my own schedule to live. Do you understand that it's the other way around? That's the true way of life. I have to fit into his schedule. I have to fit into his timetable. That's the effort of teaching logos. I taught you the train, the train tracks. Why? Because that's the way we're to live. To lay down, to become nothing. Let him become everything. So the way as I prepare this word is not just looking at my life and how far off I am still. It's so far. But... I also question, you know, because we are human, we understand human terms. We know you're tired because I get tired too. We get tired too. So we understand you have to hurry up and go home and go to sleep because you got to go to work tomorrow. So we try to close it on time. And you're like, oh, no, I don't have a ride. I have a way. I have to go to Brooklyn. I have to go to Long Island. We understand. So let's close it and let's not have you come because you need to rest. Then I kind of think, like, would Jesus do the same thing when he had said you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me? I don't know. Am I sugarcoating? We know certainly the truth is, is what Jesus said and what he did. And what he did was not living a comfortable life. He died. So we say he died, he died, he died. It sounds easy. It's not easy. He's not expecting us to puncture our bodies and torture our bodies today. But it's a resolve to not be deceived, not deceive ourselves, thinking, yeah, I heard the truth through the teaching of Church of Jesus, so I could recite to you. But let me tell you, even birds can do that. Mockingbirds, a parrot, whatever. You train those birds, and they will say after you. So you know what? Many years ago, I was counseling a teenager who was here because of by default parents are here, and I, because he was having so much trouble. And I said, why do you come to Church of Jesus? Because of your parents? And he said, because of the truth. I, I 
was speechless, not because I was impressed. Oh, my God, he knows the truth. No, because he's heard it all his life through his parents and the pastor screaming truth, 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 so they know when it's time to say truth. So the question is, are you saying the same thing even as adults or young adults? Because of the truth, what does that mean? It's easy to repeat what the pastor said and what, what you read, but is it the word that's governing your life? It's to lose. Lose what? Lose time. Lose, lose my treasures. Yes, offerings, but lose also at times promotions, better job opportunities, better living arrangement. You can't have it all. It, is it your greed that turned into somehow this sort of holy presentation? We have to... Ask ourselves, how much have I given up? How much have I lost for the sake of eternal life? Because that's what Jesus said. No one can come to the Father except through me. The words of Jesus, the life of Jesus is to deny oneself. Deny oneself, taking up his own cross to follow him. It is to give up to be popular, give up to be liked, give up to be praised, give up to have many on your side, give up to have many friends, give up to be liked and praised by your family. It's choose to be alone, lonely, without a friend because of what you believe and how you live your life. It is not to take the seat of, of a judge and say, look at me, I've been in church of Jesus for how many years and how many times I've read the Bible. I know Pastor Joe, Pastor King's sermon, so I can recite to you. It is not to say that. Don't be deceived. That's what it says. Do not mere listen to the word. James 1, 22, and so, so it says, so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. It is not to repeat. It is not to say, I know how to recite the summary, sermon summary, but it is to live it. Have I lost? Have I risked? Have I given up? Because only after sowing, there's reaping. Only after sorrow, there's joy. Only after darkness, there's light. Only after suffering, there's glory. Only after death, there is life. Let's pray. Do you know the truth? Do you think you've grasped the truth? What is the truth? The way, the truth, and the life is Yeshua. He has shown us to the way to eternal life in the Father's house. And it's to die to say no to the things my flesh wants, to say no to the things that my mind is mulling over or wanting, my heart is wanting, is to say no to that. Without that, without that, we cannot be where he is. If the religious and the philosophers torture their bodies, restrain themselves, and limit themselves so they may know a truth or perhaps the truth, and they will never be successful at it. He has shown us so clearly through the spirit of truth today who Yeshua is and how he got to the Father's house, and that was through the cross, death. How much more, how much greater would our cost, should our cost be? Are you still in sadness and dilemma, struggling what to do? Then you don't know the truth. You do not know the truth. Let's humble, be humble, and lift up our hands to heaven, our Father's house, where Yeshua, the true way, has gone and made a way and prepared a way for us. Let us truly grasp the truth let me know this true way so that I too can 